Let me welcome you. Let me welcome everyone to the Future Trends Forum. I'm very, very glad to see and hopefully hear from you all today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder, and I'll be leading you through the next hour of conversation. Mr. Markovitz has a really interesting idea. He says that we were founded on the principle of meritocracy, but the mechanisms for doing that have changed. They've been suborned. And now, in fact, we are creating and recreating and strengthening a new aristocracy. So in order to talk about this, let me welcome Professor Markovitz. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a real oh. pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Um, are you uh, in New Haven right now? I am indeed. Oh, good, good. And you're enjoying summer, which is a precious thing. Yes, it's, uh, you know, um, someone, you know, uh, academics estivate. <laughs> right? We are creatures who sleep the summer, not sleep the winter. Well, that's true of some. That's true of some. And but uh, here at the forum, we never rest, we never sleep. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, uh, thank you for contributing this book to uh, our national conversation. Uh, you make a very fierce, very strong argument. Before we get into the argument, let me ask besides estivating, what's, what's going to be occupying most of your mind and most of your time for the next year? You'll be teaching this fall, working on a new book. I'll be teaching this fall. I'm at the moment actually working on some practical things concerning um, fair funding and distribution for a potential vaccine for the coronavirus. Uh -huh. um, so this is a practical, a practical effort. Um, I'm mm. about to start another book though, which will be on uh, growth as an economic and personal ideal, mm. and uh, will express some skepticism about it. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. There's been a lot of talk this past couple of months about the degrowth agenda or about the circular economy. Um, more than a few people are citing that great adage, growth for growth's sake is the ideology of the cancer cell, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, it sounds like this is going to be a great book. Um, we all, all best to it, and we're looking forward to seeing it. I'm, well, I'm hoping that I can write it. You know, it's, uh, um, it, it has many excellences. It does not yet have the excellence of existing. <laughs> well, think of it as a, 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 a conceptual excellence. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, I have I have so many questions for you um, based on the book and based on the topic. And uh, friends, if you're new to the Future Transform, I usually lead off with a couple of questions just to get the ball rolling. Uh, but then each of you will have questions and comments, either based on what Professor Markovitz says, or based on your sense of the book, or your sense of the idea. And believe me, there's got a lot of ideas here, uh, quite a lot to think about. Uh, so let me just begin. Um, a key claim of your book is that we are, as I just said in the introduction, experiencing the kind of recreation of an aristocracy in American society. And yet so much of our culture is premised on the idea of meritocracy, that uh, the box office rewards the best movie, that academia, like Yale University, rewards the most intellectually gifted. Uh, the market is all about surfacing the best quality products and so on. How do, how do we get here? How, can, how, how do you square these two? Good. So um, you're, you're right that meritocracy has this kind of allure. It's almost the common sense of our age, whatever else people think. They think that it's both just and serves the public interest if people get ahead based on their own accomplishments rather than, say, on their parents' social class. Um, for a while, meritocracy actually functioned in that way. And, and that's because in the early years of our meritocracy, the old elite, which was really a hereditary elite, uh -huh. based on breeding, uh -huh. um, was to be blunt, not particularly hardworking and not particularly smart. Uh -huh. And so if you uh -huh. allow people to get ahead based on their accomplishments, outsiders got ahead. And, and that's what the early meritocrats wanted and valued and argued for. Um, but what has happened is that the new elite that was itself made by meritocracy could hardly be more different from the old hereditary elite in that it's filled with people who have an almost boundless taste for and skill at training their children. Mm. And so the new elite, the meritocrats of each generation, invest extraordinary amounts of skill and also extraordinary just amounts of money in educating their children and giving their children an education that not just poor kids, but also middle-class kids can't match. Mm -hmm. So just to put a number on this, and then I'll, I'll stop talking for the moment. Uh, if you take the difference between what is invested in educating a typical child of a 1% or professional household mm 
and what is invested in educating a typical middle class child in America. And take that difference and every year put it in the S&P 500 to create a trust fund to be given to the child on the death of the parents as a traditional inheritance, uh -huh. that quantity would be well in excess of $10 million per child. Oh. And that's a form of inherited privilege run through meritocracy. I see, I see. Uh, that's, that's a stark number. Um, uh, friends, I, I've got a couple of questions to follow up on that right now. Um, and a bunch of you have been uh, putting in questions and comments in the, in the chat box. Um, Professor Markovitz, uh, we have a, li a rogue librarian uh, who says that she worked in some Yale collections back in the day. Um, so that's a, that's a mm -hmm. nice collection to see. Um, so at some point, we turn to a, a literal meritocracy, and then that meritocracy has become an aristocracy by, in effect, um, pulling up the, pulling up the uh, ladder beneath them uh, as they ascended. And education forms a key component of that. Uh, let me let me ask a, a, a basic uh, question about that. Uh, in the, in the United States, uh, we have publicly funded K through 12 that is universal. Uh, it's universally accessible through all kinds of measures. Uh, we have an enormous post-secondary sector of colleges and universities, uh, which is extraordinarily diverse, geographically very very distributed. Uh, we have an elaborate system of financial aid, everything from loans and scholarships and grants. We have uh, a testing apparatus, multiple tests, which are designed to, to winnow out uh, people based on their academic excellence. Uh, we have an you know, enormous commitment uh, to this. Um, how is it simply that the, the very wealthiest have managed to uh, privatize their education to drive that kind of success? Or is there some other kind of mechanism that we need to know about? Well, first of all, the distinction between public and private is complicated and somewhat artificial in our society, in particular because of local funding of public schools. So as many people uh, in your forum probably know better than I, uh, the average middle class American school spends somewhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars per pupil per year on educating its children. Um, a school in a really poor area might spend eight or nine thousand dollars per pupil per year, but a school in a really wealthy area, including a public school, a school say in Scarsdale, New York, uh -huh. will spend thirty thousand dollars a year uh -huh. educating its children. And this is all inside the public system, and this doesn't even take into account voluntary parental donations to things like the PTA. And notice that the gap between thirty and fifteen, or thirty and twelve is six or seven times as big as the gap between the middle class and the poor school. Um, in fact, the U.S. is one of only three wealthy countries which spends more per pupil per year on rich kids than poor kids in its public system. So we're an outlier. Almost all wealthy countries direct their public subsidies for education disproportionately to poorer children. We do not. Um, and no. of course, in addition to this, Private schools spend much, much more. If you look at the top 20 private schools in America, according to Forbes magazine, they spend on average about seventy to $75,000 per pupil per year. And a lot of that spending is, in fact, public subsidy because they're organized as not-for-profits. So alumni donations are tax-deductible. Their endowments can grow exempt from tax. And just to give you a sense for the scale of that subsidy, the richest private university in America per pupil is Princeton. The richest overall is Harvard, but the richest per student is Princeton. Hmm. Princeton's tax exemption, somebody recently calculated, amounts to a public subsidy of about $100,000 per Princeton student per year. Wow. Compare that to the public subsidy for Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, which is about $12,500 per student per year or Essex County Community College, which is about $2,500 per student per year. Mm. So Princeton gets a public subsidy in the form of tax preference, which is 40 times as big as mm. the public subsidy given to the local community college, mm. not even though there are more kids at Princeton from the top 1% of the income distribution than the bottom half. So it's a massive upside down public subsidy of rich kids. And oh, that's one of the things that we're producing in this country. Uh, in the in the chat came a, uh, a a bit of a pointed question, which is, uh, what's Yale's public subsidy? Do you know? 
I don't know what Yale's public subsidy is actually, um, but it's going to be large. It's going to be not quite as big as Princeton's, um, but Yale is uh, an extremely wealthy university. I can tell you that there are more students at Yale College from the top 1% of the income distribution than from the bottom 60%. So Yale, again, disproportionately benefits rich kids. Uh, it, so that's a good answer to, to my question. Uh, friends, I have more to, to ask, but uh, I think uh, you're already starting to ask some. So remember, if you're new to this, uh, either uh, press the uh, raised hand button if you'd like to join us on stage, or uh, click the question mark if you'd like to give us a text question. Uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick at Simon Fraser asked about how school systems are funded. Uh, Kathleen, uh, those are locally. Um, if you'd like to follow up on what uh, Professor Markovitz has just uh, outlined, uh, follow up with another, another good question. Uh, we have a great deep question, typically, from uh, Tom Ames in um, Houston. Does, does education create social mobility, or does it just reinforce inequalities? So I think that's a very deep question, because I think the answer is it does both. Mm -hmm. And the question is, for whom and which effect is more powerful? So uh, it creates social mobility in the sense that, compared to the old types of aristocracies, which were based on race, on gender, on class, education makes it possible for people to improve their social positions. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, a society in which to stay ahead, you have to be a white Christian man. There are large segments of the population that are simply categorically excluded. And education doesn't categorically exclude. In that sense, it produces social mobility. At the same time, because education works, it produces capacities and privilege, a world in which those who have most privileged parents get the most education also blocks social mobility by giving those who have the most a leg up still further. And you, know, you see that writ large in some of the phenomena I'm describing. You see it writ small in the fact that things like the SAT which on the one hand mean that in principle, anybody can score really well and get admitted to any college in the country. On the other hand, if people were admitted to colleges based exclusively on SAT scores, college populations would be richer, more Christian and whiter than they are now. And that's because those who have the most are best able to prepare for the test and do the best on the test. So I think the question is, are you interested in the outlier? Or are you interested in the middle of the distribution, the typical case? And mm -hmm. at this moment, what education does is it provides mobility for the outlier and mm -hmm. establishes hierarchy for the typical case. So the middle is is put in hierarchy and uh, the extremes, um, both the very low and the very high are supported. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Tom, if you want to follow up with that on a video, uh, let me know. Uh, we have a, another question that's just come in from Steve Covello. Uh, he's an instructional designer in New Hampshire, and we bring him up on stage. Hello, Steve. Good to see you. Howdy. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me okay? I hope you, yes, you can. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here today. I'm so glad that, uh, that you were asked to speak because I just listened to your interview with Sam Harris, uh, uh -huh. the whole thing, and I, so I may be a little bit of the, ahead of the narrative here, and, and I was very eager to ask you this question. Now, your proposal for a one-time rich people tax, or perhaps that's not right right way to put it, for balancing what appears to be the differential and in parental investment, sounds to me at least like affirmative action in, in some way. Is your thesis here based on the idea that at all in kinship with a, affirmative action? And do you even see this as a as a viable solution? Or or, or is what you're proposing here to to compensate or balance things? have nothing to do with something programmatic like affirmative action. Uh, great, so there's a, there's a lot there. Um, let, me, let me just give a little background uh, since I, I guess probably a lot of people did not hear that other interview. Um, one of the things that I've come out in favor of both in, on that podcast and in the New York Times uh, is a one-time wealth tax in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and the thought there is actually not specifically connected to education, it's just that what the disease has done is exacerbate prior inequalities. It's, um, you know, elites, professionals can work from home, can keep their jobs, can keep their salaries, whereas middle and working class people both, both lose their uh, economic base and put themselves physically at risk in doing their work. 
And it seems like a fair way to start to respond to that is to have the most privileged people pay a large portion of the economic bill for the relief packages that the pandemic is causing. Um, at the same time, I do think that we have created a world in which concentrations of privilege are absolutely enormous. And they go to income, they go to wealth, they go to human capital and training. Along almost any dimension of measurement, the share that the best off are getting has grown and grown and grown. And so I favor some form of redistribution that takes from those who have the most for the benefit, not just of the worst off, not just of the poor, but also for the benefit of the middle class in order to produce a society and an economy in which the middle of the distribution is the leading force in our collective life. Um, is that related to affirmative action? Well, it will have consequences for racial inequality. It will ameliorate racial inequality, particularly in the middle of the distribution. If by affirmative action, you're focused particularly on race in America, the racial wealth gap in this country is very, very large. Um, interestingly, the interactions between race and class have become very complicated in recent decades. So that um, if you look at, for example, for African-American men, the income distribution the gap between the average income of the very richest white men and the very richest black men has been diminishing in recent decades, even as the gap between the income of the average white man and the average black man has not been diminishing much. So that there's a complicated interplay between race and class and the forms of hierarchy that we have in our society. And both of them are extremely powerful and independent drivers of stratification. Um, my own private politics are that we should do a lot to reduce both forms of inequality. But the argument of the book is not, you know, if I come to you as a scholar who's, who's done certain kinds of work and published it, that work has been principally on class, not race. And my views on race are more the views of a citizen than the views of an academic specialist. Ooh. That's a very, very detailed answer, a uh, very nuanced answer. Um, Steve, um, does that help? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, it, I think my only having mentioned affirmative action was that as a concept for remedying what appears to have been a historical injustice is a programmatic one, as opposed to something which is it's kind of one and done as far as redistribution yeah. is concerned. So, I mean, that's really where my differential is here in trying to understand whether sure. what you're talking about something is more programmatic or whether it's more just sort of distribution driven. So it seems yeah. like there's some kind of kinship between historical injustice, both from a class standpoint and a racial standpoint, but that the solutions for remedying that are not necessarily the same. Yes. In, in, in yeah, good. So on that front, um, I, I believe that the kinds of inequalities that have been building up are structural and systematic and therefore require programmatic ongoing That's where I was going interventions mm -hmm. in order to reduce them. Um, the thing about the one-time wealth tax was specifically keyed to the current pandemic, okay. which has this very peculiar quality, which is that um, those who, are, who have the most are suffering the least, and yeah. it's not clear what individuals can do in the name of solidarity to share the burden of the catastrophe. Mm. If you're a doctor or a healthcare worker, there are things you can do. But if you're a well-meaning, privileged professional, in your individual capacity, you don't have any particular skills that are suited to this moment. And the thought was a one-time charge against the accumulated wealth of the most privileged is an appropriate collective response to a calamity that is hitting everybody, but that only some are really suffering from. That was, that was the idea there. Um, and it's in a way independent of whatever I may believe about education and class stratification in good times. Interesting. Steve, thank you very much for that great question. Um, and Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, we'll uh, 
we have a, a whole bunch of other questions that have just been coming up. Um, so let me uh, um, uh, shift ground a little bit um, to um, uh, bring those up. So uh, we have uh, text questions that have come in from Kiel Dumsch. And I want to make sure that we get to see them. But it's actually a three-part question. So I need to flash this on the screen kind of like uh, flashcards. So here, let me just let me see how this goes. Um, uh, he says that uh, regarding schooling, what you call meritocracy is, in fact, a schoolocracy. This condition is caused by colleges controlling access to the job world with their degrees and alumni network. All right, so that's part one, schoolocracy. Um, then he says, your, your solutions, like forcing elite colleges to enroll more low-income students, is a step in the right direction, but it doesn't get the core issue, which is colleges controlling access to jobs. All right. And then how, finally, the question. The way to stop this is to make it illegal to hire by where someone went to school and to turn credentialing over to a third party similar to the CPA exam for jobs and accounting. Your thoughts? Great, thank you. Um, let me go backwards through the three parts and, <laughs> and I'll then end up at a point at which I think my views um, draw reasonable objections and criticism from all sides. So, so on the idea of inserting an independent third party to break the link between interested colleges and employers, um, I'll set aside the question of whether it should be made illegal or not, because that's a question of what the appropriate role of the state is in regulating private behavior. And one might think, it would be a really good thing if it didn't happen, but it still shouldn't be made illegal. That's a plausible view. And I, and I don't wanna pick up particularly the question about when the state should use law. Um, we did that to some degree with the SAT. So that you know the way in which schools used to feed people to colleges is through alumni networks. In fact, the language of elite university admission in the 1950s was not that people applied to colleges, it's that sons put themselves down for, that was the language they used, the colleges their fathers had attended. And what the SAT was meant to do was precisely what the question suggests, which is break the self-interested power of schools to prefer their, their pupils with their alumni and get them into the next colleges. And for a while, the SAT really worked at that. So that as the SAT gathered steam, fewer and fewer prep school kids got into top colleges and universities, fewer and fewer children of alumni got into top colleges and universities, and instead you got in based on the test. And, and then what happened is what we discussed earlier, which is the new elite figured out that there are two ways to get a leg up. One is through the old boy net, and the other is by really training your children so they can do really well on the test. And training your children to do well on the test is maybe a more burdensome way of privileging those who already have, but it's no less effective. And so my worry is that if we were to insert some independent evaluating mechanism between colleges and jobs, what would happen is that the colleges that have the most resources have the best ability to pre-select students for the capacity to do well at whatever the independent evaluator measures, would now come to dominate the independent evaluator in just the way in which elite schools have come to dominate the SAT. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a sense for how incredibly powerful this effect is, uh, in a typical recent year, there are roughly speaking 15,000 kids in America with a parent who has attended graduate or professional school, whose SAT verbal score hits the Ivy League median. If I ask you how many kids are there, neither of whose parents graduated high school, whose verbal SAT hits the Ivy League median, the answer is it, it turns out the tail is so thin that statistical inference is unreliable, but oh. if you crank out the numbers, it's 32. 30. 32. So you have an independent agency the college board, administering a test to try to select for people without directly referencing where their parents went to school or what education their parents have. And you have a situation in which hundreds of times more kids of fancy educated parents win at that system 
than kids whose parents don't have a fancy education. So, so I worry about that. Yeah. Um, and this sort of leads back to the frame at the beginning of the tripartite question, mm -hmm. which is my, my view of these matters has this peculiar character, which is that I believe that elite education actually imparts something in those who receive it that others have a hard time getting. What I is say something, I, I wanna be very careful about this, yeah. um, because it's another part of my view that that thing is maybe not so valuable, but it is rationally related to what employers want. And so when employers hire kids from the fanciest schools, what they're picking for is a set of capacities that they have designed the workplace to favor. And it's not simply arbitrary discrimination or simply privileging people in your network. It's doing something that's economically rational. And the problem is that we've made an education sector and a labor market, which reinforce hierarchy in both so that we get a lot of inequality. And the reason we get it is that education works as advertised, which is why the kinds of reforms that I'm interested in mm -hmm. don't just go to making allocation mechanisms fairer or more open, but go to actually spreading out education across more people so that there are more investments in educating more people, particularly more people whose parents aren't rich. And, and I, I, that's the solution because on my view, the problem is not that education doesn't work, it's that it does work, but it's unfairly distributed. Again, the question of distribution. Keel uh, follows up with a quick note in chat. Let me just read this. Uh, an independent test would be infinitely preferable to colleges controlling credentialing, which is a huge conflict of interest. And I would anticipate, uh, Counselor, that you would say that test could be suborned and gamed just like uh, everything else. I think that's the basic story that I want to tell. And that's why, you know, let's let's be clear about this. Um, if college admissions were based only on the SAT, rather than including things like alumni preferences, including things like where you went to high school, guidance counselors, letters of recommendation, whether you play a sport, the result would be less equal, not more equal which is not to say the system we have now is just or equal or fair, it's just to say that the SAT is one of the most gameable parts of the system. Ah. Ah. Hill, thank you for a fantastic idea, for a great provocation. Um, and um, uh, Professor Markovitz, thank you for, uh, um, for diving into this. Uh, Keel has more comments, but I, I, we can return to those. I wanna make sure that everybody gets a chance to uh, uh, to ask. We've shared some resources, by the way. Uh, we have um, uh, Professor Markovitz was interviewed by uh, Sam Harris. It's in his uh, podcast called Making Sense, episode 205. Uh, I put that in the chat box. I, hopefully you can see it. I also put it out on Twitter um, so we can see that. Uh, and then we have uh, David Prensky um, points us to David Larrabee's recent book, A Perfect Mess, The Unlikely Ascendancy of American Higher Education. Um, so again, thank you for that, David. Um, now we have uh, another video question. Again, if, if you're new to this, you can see how easy it is for us to display text questions or video questions. Uh, so to give you an example of one of those video questions brought up, uh, we'll bring up a longtime friend of the program, a personal friend, and just a delightful human being, uh, Roxanne Riskin, uh, also from Connecticut. So let's see if we can add her to the show. Hello, Roxanne. Hi, Brian. Thank you for those kind words. <laughs> yes. Hi, Roxanne. How are you? I want to be from Connecticut right now, but uh, yeah. thank you, Professor. You have really um, enlightened me in a various uh, in various ways, and um, my question is a contrarian question, and I want to ask you if you've heard about rich shaming and how you will address students um, who have privileged parents being discriminated against. That's part one. And do you think it's really necessary to shame rich people who care about their kids' academic education? Great. Um, 
So a couple points about this. Um, it's a part of the argument of the meritocracy trap. Um, there are two parts of the argument that are relevant to this question. The first is that the kinds of inequality that we're facing now can arise and mostly do arise without any individual persons doing something vicious or immoral. It, they arise instead because we have a system in which, as you say, parents want to support their children and want to help their children, and parents who are wealthy and have means will naturally deploy those means to the benefit of their kids. And it's not a part of the book to argue that that's somehow disgraceful or terrible. Um, it does have terrible consequences for our society. And so we're in a situation in which when ordinary people behave in the ways in which ordinarily decent people do, the result is awful. But that doesn't mean that any one of their individual behaviors is worthy of sort of private moral condemnation. There are no villains in this story. And part of the idea of the book is that to be politically serious about structural reform is not to focus on individual villains or private moral vices, but instead to focus on structure. And structure is what drives the way ordinary people behave. Mm. Um, a second point of the book is that this system actually is not in the human interest of the elite because the rich kids in some sense benefit from all the education that's bought for them. Um, but it's no fun to be a rich kid in America today and go to schools that require hours and hours of homework and have tutors and testing coaches and be evaluated all the time and the system is so competitive that although having privilege is almost necessary for success, it doesn't guarantee success. So the privileged are constantly worried that they're going to lose too. And so this system doesn't even serve the human interests of the elite. And it's not that I think if you're in the middle class in America, you should have much sympathy with the elite. Um, at the same time, the fact that it doesn't serve the human interests of the elite mean that the rich also have a reason to change the system. Now, you can't change the system one person at a time. If a single rich family decides this is an unfair system, it's not a good system, and decides to pull out of the rat race, the result is that their children will lose. And no one wants to do And parents who love their children don't want that. Even as parents know that if they participate in the, result, in the rat race, the result is that their children will be run ragged and overwhelmed and lose many of their authentic interests and also won't do well. And this is why structural reform is the answer. So it's a system change. It's a system change. It's a system change. Systems take decades to change. Yes. And they take decades. It's, it's a generational project. It's not a project for one year. Hmm. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Roxanne, thank you for the great question. Um, you really, that's, that clarifies a great deal. Um, and um, and thank you again for being a great supporter uh, of the program. Love being here. <laughs> of course. Uh, speaking of uh, a video, and uh, we have another guest who won, or another participant who wants to join us on stage. This is uh, another person with a great name, Brian. Unfortunately, he's got a terrible spelling error in it, but otherwise we're welcoming him to the program. Uh, this is Brian Mulligan. Hello, Brian. Hi, folks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfect, Hi, Brian. How are you? I'm from Sligo in Ireland. I have, uh, uh, listen, I, I think this is a great topic. I've only become recently aware of the difficulties with meritocracy. Uh, but I suppose my question here is I'm a little bit puzzled about why you're suggesting there should be significant transfer of wealth from the rich to the middle class. I think research in well-being and happiness would show that there's diminishing returns on wealth and that when you get up from the bottom into the middle class, you're not going to get much happier if you get more wealth. Um, and that really, I feel that this discussion is focusing too much on the rich and what they have rather than pulling up the poor. And that's also illustrated by the fact that we're talking so much about elite universities. When in actual fact, the solution to the problem, I would see it is, 
is for the rich to help the poor. And this is through primary school education and secondary school education, because we know community college can get you into the middle class. So we're, I think we're spending too much time worrying about what the elite are doing with their kids. Let them go to these universities because we can be perfectly happy going to a third grade university. Our kids will be fine. And if they go to community college or if they get a trade, we're focusing too much on the rich and elite universities. Great. Thank you for that. Um, let me give a three-part answer. Uh, the first part is one place in which I agree with you entirely is that uh, we should not focus on universities exclusively, um, but on the, the entire life cycle of training. So mm -hmm. primary school, middle school, high school, pre-kindergarten, so the training that two and three-year-olds get, um, especially in the United States, but also in the UK, Ireland, I know less well. Um, there are enormous disparities in the training that rich and middle-class people give their children throughout the life cycle of training. And we should focus all the way through. We should also incidentally focus on adult training, uh, an extremely important and underemphasized and extremely damaging development in uh, adult education in the Anglo-Saxon world in particular has been the destruction of workplace training. So that it used to be that adult workers in the US, in the UK, got substantial training on the job through their employers. And that that training dramatically improved their earnings power and also their discretion and social position over the course of their adult working lives. And that training has been almost entirely stripped out of large firms and small firms. And that's extremely costly. So at that point, I agree with you entirely. This is a story about the life cycle of education, not about the four years in college. The place I want to push back is two parts. One, why am I focused on the elite? And two, why am I focused on the middle class rather than the poor? And, and uh, there are related answers to that. First of all, I want to absolutely acknowledge that uh, the worst off in a society are the poor. And it's a perfectly plausible moral view. It's, it's my own moral view that those who have the greatest claim concerning economic justice are the worst off. So that there's a lot of reason to focus on the poor. Always has been, always will be. Nevertheless, here are two things that are true, particularly in the US, also in the UK. First, poverty has been going down. In 1960 in the United States, the poverty rate probably was about 33%. Official poverty statistics weren't calculated in the US until the early 1960s. Most recently now, before the pandemic, the poverty rate in the US was about 11.5%. Still unconscionably high, but much, much lower than it was at the middle of the last century. At the same time, the concentration of income and wealth at the top has been going up so that the share of national income captured by the richest 1% of households is over twice as big now as it was in 1960. In fact, the most recent census report simultaneously reported historic lows in the poverty rate and historic highs in the concentration of income among the rich. Mm. And so one of the reasons to focus on the rich is that this is where the economic growth is. This is where the inequality is. And what's happened has been a massive transfer of advantage away from the middle class, a little bit towards the poor, and mostly towards an incredibly narrow elite. And that's been extremely destructive for our economic, social, and political order. It has also been extremely destructive of middle class well being. If you look at the data gathered by Ann Case and Angus Deaton for the US, Midlife mortality for middle-class people has been going up, even before the pandemic. It's actually been going up in the UK also. And it is demographically unheard of for mortality to go up absent war, economic collapse, or epidemic disease. And yet, between 2015 and 2019, in both Britain and the US, Midlife mortality has been going up, and it's been going up in the middle class. And the sources of this rising mortality have been drug addiction, overdose, alcoholism, 
and suicide, forms of direct and indirect self-harm. And the diagnosis of the meritocracy trap book is that the reason for that is that we have a form of structural inequality and structural exclusion, which means that middle-class people, not only poor people, also poor people, cannot get advantage in a society that increasingly concentrates income and status in a narrow elite, and that meritocracy then characterizes the results of this exclusion as an individual failure to measure up so that the middle class is not just economically excluded from advantage, but also morally insulted and told that it's the source of its own failings. And that that combination of economic injury and moral insult is the source of the incredibly damaging self-harm that is driving rising mortality. So I think it's perfectly morally proper to remain primarily committed to alleviating the greatest need, which is in the poor, but the distinctive forms of inequality that our societies suffer and the distinctive harm of the age is to the middle class. And that's why I think we need to focus on closing the gap between the rich and the middle class. Well, that's a fantastic answer. Um, Brian, would you, uh, would you like to uh, respond? Well, what occurred to me as you were talking is that maybe the middle class is a very broad definition and that you have yes. sorts in the middle class. Uh, and typically, I would have, uh, my perception, I suspect the perception in the UK and Ireland of what mi middle class is in the, and in the US is somewhat different. Uh, but my perception of the middle class would be those that have enough money and, you know, are able to take care of their kids, their family, have shelter or whatever, are able to get by. And a lot of the problems of the middle class are often to do with, what would you say, issues with regards to status or uh, yeah. other issues that they really shouldn't have if they took a different attitude to life, perhaps. And being jealous of the rich could be one of those. Yes. So what I'm saying is that, uh, so, but then again, if, if we're talking about a broad middle class, you can see somebody at the lower end of the middle class that are in genuine financial hardship, even though the working poor type of, uh, so, so maybe my generalization or the generalization of the middle class is part of the problem here. Well, so I think the extreme version of this point, uh, there is a big gap between particularly the Southern England, London and South of London conception of the middle class is one in which the middle class is what Americans would call the professional class. Um, these are office workers, mind workers, degree-based workers, um, and they are characterized in contradistinction to the aristocracy, which is an old-fashioned hereditary elite. Whereas in U.S. English, what the middle class means is effectively everybody between the 30th percentile of the income distribution and somewhere around the 90th or something like that. That's the broad middle class. That's the group that I'm talking about here. Uh, it is an interesting feature of the English usage that many people in England who call themselves middle class are able through this form of language to disguise the fact that they are in fact now the elite. And uh, I think part of your question is driven by that sensibility, that there's something odd going on there and that lots of people who call themselves middle class are, are the beneficiaries of these trends, not the victims of them. And, and I agree, particularly with respect to, to English English usage. Yeah. And I suspect that Irish usage is in that way quite similar. Thanks very much. Thank uh, you. Ryan, thank you for the great question and uh, have a good night. Um, and I'm glad you could make it here. Um, uh, we have friends, uh, we are actually coming close to the end of the hour. And I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to uh, uh, ask their questions. Uh, we have a stack of them coming in. Um, and uh, I want to bring to the stage uh, Meg Tufano from Antioch University. Uh, she has a great title of the Affiliate Professor of Critical Thinking. So let's see if we can bring Meg up. Hello, Meg. Hey. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. How Thank you? you so much. My question now I have two questions because when I asked the first question, you said other things. But my first question is, couldn't you solve this by making every child in the United States get the same amount of money in their primary and secondary educations? Get rid of the 
of the uh, property tax craziness. I mean, that would like seemingly instantly erase a lot of what the problems are. I live in Appalachia. Mm. So my, my 20 years ago when I started teaching, I taught at community colleges with students who lived in their cars and it was so normal. It, it was so normal that it's, it's hard to describe to someone who grew up in Washington, DC. I had never even realized people could live like that. Um, and they do. And they have uh, incredible um, grip. Second question I'm going to ask, and I'm going to let you answer the first question, but Second question is you used education and training interchangeably. And I think maybe we could make a huge difference in all of the problems going on at university top level conversations if we would readdress what the difference is. I, I, most of the jobs that you are trained for or can be trained for, maybe you don't need a humanities degree. Maybe you don't need a Bachelor of Liberal Arts. Maybe you need a certificate. I don't know. Mm. But there are that argument is being something, we were talking about it and somehow it disappeared. Right. Um, and you just conflated both words. So I have those two questions. Could we solve the same thing by just yeah. radically changing the financing of yeah. primary and secondary schools? And how do, should we think about training and education? Great. So for me. Great. those are both fantastic questions. Um, on the first, it would, it would be an enormous step towards fairness and social and human flourishing if we radically equalized expenditures on education for all kids. Um, but that's almost impossible to do in our social and economic order because um, the deep structures of our federalism make local financing of education difficult legally to undo. And the political economy produced by this education structure makes it politically almost impossible to upend. The amount of political and legal power concentrated in the public school districts that now overfund is enormous. And this is one reason why it turns out to be a politically feasible project to reduce or even eliminate the gap between what the public system spends on poor kids and middle class kids. But it is simply not a politically feasible project directly to eliminate the ability of rich parents to spend more than the average on their kids' education. And one of the things I try to do in the meritocracy trap is to produce a series of arguments and mechanisms that will attack that effectively over time without requiring that we effectively abolish local control over school finance all at once, which I regard as desirable but not politically feasible. Okay, and that's a political judgment and it's also a legal judgment and I could be wrong um, um, fr from, your, from your lips to God's ears, that I'm wrong about that because you're right. It would be a much better system. Um, I think it'd be politically easier than taking money from rich people, but but I, I, you know I'm not a Marxist, so. Well, we can we can you know we, we this is a longer conversation, but that that's what the judgment is about. And 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 on the second point about education and training, look, um, there's a a shallow and a deep version of that question. The the shallow version of that question focuses not just on the education versus training distinction but on the fact that we lump education into large units, which we call degrees. And um, micro-credentialing is a way of parceling out education in smaller chunks, where the smaller chunks are more rationally related to the skills and tasks that people will need to do in order to convert their education slash training into income on the labor market. And there are lots of reasons to believe 
that if those chunks can be individuated and delivered, this would be a more fair and equal system. There is a long-term problem, which is that trends in automation, both of machines and of code, mm -hmm. mean that more and more of the smaller tasks will no longer need to be done by people at all. And the thing that actually will be marketable, translatable into wages on the labor market, will be abstract, high-level, and creative conceptual thought. And that is harder to micro-credential. Um, with yeah, respect to the deeper right. difference between education and training, right. I agree with you. Education is a humanistic enterprise that goes to developing a certain set of existential attitudes towards the condition of the person who has it, whereas training is an economically rationalizable exercise which goes to building human capital so that the person's skill set commands a higher wage in the labor market. One of the things that has happened in our society as elite labor comes to dominate top incomes is there's a huge pressure to think of all schooling in terms of training. And this distorts universities, schools, and colleges all throughout the status hierarchy in a series of ways that are undesirable from the perspective of education. I actually have a, I have a piece coming out in the Three Penny Review about exactly this idea. Yeah, the, the, the idea, my, my students arrive in my classes when I taught freshmen. They're looking for meaning. Right. They're looking for contact. Right. They're looking for significance. Right. What makes me significant? What they're getting now, I mean, I'm not sure always, but what they're getting a lot is science. Yeah. Science can't say anything. And by yeah. definition, it can't say anything about meaning, contact significance so there's this fight yeah. it's been going on since the 60s whenever science took over the university but it and the daughter technology which has all the money <clears throat> but but the but the human part yeah. is the part that is the per my my purpose um was the purpose of the university and what i think when you said about uh, all of those people middle class people so many people, oh my God, in Appalachia, it's a nightmare. Um, the number of people dying from fentanyl, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mean, the, the drug problem is overwhelming, but it's a despair problem. Yes. And so, and so what's weird is that education is really addressing that, you know, yeah. meaning, contact, significance. Usually you're not in despair if you have a sense of meaning, if you feel contact, if you have a sense of significance about your life. So. I think that that is essentially a description of the humanities. I still can't figure out why these people going to Princeton and Yale and Harvard with these phenomenal professors and lecturers and <laughs> I've got on a Princeton t-shirt. <laughs> anyway, my point is that I don't understand why they are getting the better jobs when what is different about their education mostly is that they are having very high level discussions about meaning, contact, significance. Is it because they are less in despair? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm asking that as an open question. I have no idea. Um, I don't see the line. I don't see the connection from a um, businessman's point of view. What, what is he getting more of when he hires a graduate of Princeton as compared to a graduate from somewhere else? I, I personally know too many people in too many universities and I don't see some dramatic, magical thing that uh, somebody from Harvard, I mean, the Unabomber went to Harvard. It doesn't mean anything to me. But anyway, that's a discussion for a long discussion for another day. Like, I, I, I hate to... Uh, um... Uh, to pause this, but um, we are actually at the end of our hour, uh, and we're a little over. Um, and you have asked such a great question. The chat box is just rippling with with responses. And Professor Markowitz, I, I want to give you a chance to answer that giant ball of question before we go. <laughs> well, I don't want to trespass any more on people's time. Um, I, I think rather than try to argue one side of the question, I just want to 
in, in essence, repeat it. There is a deep issue here. And the deep issue is this. Does all of the fancy schooling that the rich give their children cause the children to have a series of capacities that employers have reason to pay for? Mm -hmm. Or instead, does it simply give them a network that makes them valuable? Two um, very my, my position, which is an awkward one, I believe it to be true, but is an awkward one, is both that it actually gives them capacities, which employers have reason to pay for, and that the system that produces this kind of education is unjust and destructive. So usually you have people who think the system is unjust and destructive, and they believe that fancy education is just a network. Or you have people who believe that fancy education produces real capacities, but the system is groovy. And, and I am on, on opposite sides of that set of questions in a, in, a, in a position that makes my view assailable from both left and right, as it were. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a feature of the view, whether right or not. Um, but, but you've accurately characterized something important about the argument. But you've uh, you you managed to offend everybody, it seems, um, Professor Markovitz. But you've done the opposite with uh, with our crowd. Uh, Meg, thank you so much uh, for the for a great oh, discussion. Nice uh, to meet you in person. <laughs> uh, pleasure. I I admire I uh, envy your students already. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, Professor Markovitz, let me just ask one last question. Uh, besides your new book, which we will return you to writing now, uh, how else can we keep up with you? How else can we follow your uh, your thinking and your work? Um, if people want, I tweet occasionally. So uh, DS Markovitz, I, I never tweet about my own work. I I've made a decision I would never tweet out my own work, but I do tweet out pretty systematically um, other people's work that I come across that is related to questions of education and justice. Nice. Um, so that I'll, I'll that it's, it's a place people can go and uh, get links to to what I regard as good articles for what that's worth. Um, that's like a, a lot. Um, B.S. Markovitz, gotcha. Um, and uh, your next piece is coming out in the uh, Three Penny Review. I have something coming out in the Three Penny Review. There are a couple other things that are probably going to come out in the popular press in one way or another. Um, but I'm about to, you know, dig a deep hole in this new book, and uh, and see what comes. Understood. Well, the rest of us are really looking forward to you getting out the other side of that hole. And um, too. Too, I have to bring you back to the program because you've been fantastic. Well, I've been very, very grateful to you for setting this up and to everybody for asking such fabulous questions. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody stay safe, please. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But don't go away, folks, because uh, we. I just want to share some notes about uh, what's coming up. Uh, and let me just second Professor Markovitz's praise of you. Thank you all for these fantastic, fantastic questions. Uh, for the next two months, remember, we have a whole series of great topics coming up. If you just want to go to tinyurl.com slash forum summer, you'll find links to the next uh, five or six programs. So you can join us for those, everything from High Flex to Fall 2020 Planning, the student experience, the demographics, improving teaching. Just go to tinyurl.com slash forum summer. Or if you're already subscribed to our email list, so get these as they come up. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these fantastic questions about schoolocracy and meritocracy, about credentialing and how to create reform, we continue these conversations in many places, including on LinkedIn, including a Slack channel, including a Facebook group, but above all on Twitter. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander. Uh, in the meantime, we're over time. Let me thank you all for a great conversation. And let me, again, second the uh, our, our professor's uh, comments. Please, everyone, stay safe in this extraordinary time. Take care. We'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>